I think if we think about the past 100 years or the past 2,000 years, we can think very much of a, of a world in which there are centrifugal technologies that enable us to spread out and centripetal technologies that draw us in. And the futures of cities will be shaped by these technologies. And we're certainly in an era in which technology is changing quickly and has the capacity to change cities quickly as well. I think in particular, I'm delighted to speak here today because uh, I think we're going to see in the next year a big push towards increasing transportation spending. And I think that can be a very good thing if it's done well and can be a very unwise thing if it's done poorly. And I think it's absolutely critical that all of the terrific minds that are connected here uh, use, your, use your power for good and not evil. Uh, <laughs> transportation technologies, above all, have been shaping cities for centuries. America's urban system, right, all of the older, colder cities were fundamentally based on transportation technology during the time. Every one of the 20 largest cities in the US in 1900 was on a major waterway. The change in the cost of moving a ton a mile in real dollars over the course of the 20th century is a roughly 90% decline, right? And that's the backdrop for the moving of factories and then people from cities that had a comparative advantage at the old transportation technology, right, the waterways and the railroads, to places that were cheaper. So we have a tremendous move to right-to-work states and move to lower-cost locations throughout the country. And of course, we didn't just reshape our manufacturing in places that were car-friendly. We reshaped our whole cities around the car. Right? And uh, that's how I would see the great suburbanization of America. Right? It's a, it's a moving of, of people to areas in which they can get around by car rather than walking. And the car is fundamentally different from all of our er earlier urban transportation systems because all of the rest of them are fundamentally hub and spoke. Right? They involve some walking from where you get to the, the red line drops you off. You still got to walk to wherever you're going to. Right? Cars are point to point. They both enable large amounts of space to be consumed and require large amounts of space to be consumed, which is why car-based cities feel so totally different. It's often depicted as if cities are the enemy of the environment. I think the opposite is the case. Uh, and I, I like to illustrate this with a story about a young Harvard College graduate who, in a beautiful spring day in 1844, went for a walk outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a chowder, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass, and a fire started, and it spread, and it spread. And by the time it was done, it was a raging inferno that had burned down more than 400 acres of, of prime forest land. In his own day, this young man was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The Concord Freeman called him a flibberty gibbet, which I think is pretty bad for 1844. And it's hard not to think that they were probably right, that in fact, I can't think of any young man in Cambridge or Boston at the same time, time period who did as much damage to the environment as this young gentleman did. Of course, today, he is somewhat oddly revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. His name, of course, is Henry David Thoreau. And his book, Walden, preaches the gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. Now, it may have been wonderful for Thoreau, but it sure as heck wasn't wonderful for nature that he decided to spend all that time in Thoreau. And I think his own life teaches a somewhat different gospel, which is that we are a destructive species. And if you love nature, it often makes sense to stay away from it, as indeed Thoreau would have done a great deal of good if he had stuck with high-density living rather than moving outside. As in transportation, technology and infrastructure is very rarely enough. I was taught as a kid growing up in New York that New York was once a filthy place, and then the fine engineers built the Croton Aqueduct that brought in the waters from upstate New York, and henceforth the city was clean and washed, washed of all of its diseases and, and death. Now, you should be able to figure out yourself why that story doesn't look great to me. Right here, 1842, is when the Croton Aqueduct opened. Now, I, I don't know how many of you are you know, time series analysts, but I certainly don't see any great trend break or big drop down in death rates after Croton opened. It was not until you had behavioral adjustments, which followed this point, and here's when you do see the trend going down, which actually required citizens to connect to the sewerage and to the water wells, which required tenement owners to build those connections and pay for them on subject of law. So you face penalties otherwise, right, that you start seeing this. And it reminds us of the need for behavioral adjustments. Now, the transportation equivalent, of course, is the fundamental law of highway traffic, right, is this paper by Gilles Duranton and Matthew Turner, which shows that vehicle miles traveled increased roughly one for one with highway miles built, right? And we know this and we have seen this for decades, right, that there is a huge behavioral response in that follows making transportation easier. I am terrified about what autonomous vehicles will actually do to traffic in, in the cities. So unless this is coupled with something that pushes back on the behavioral response, this could well be a curse rather than a, than a blessing. We have you know, a passion for infrastructure. And we have a passion for infrastructure that occurs often for the wrong reasons. Because in fact, the right reason to do infrastructure is in fact, mobility is valuable. 
right? And we all want to get around. If you're thinking in this frame of mind which says, I'm going to evaluate a project based on how many jobs it creates, it means you're not evaluating by asking yourself, what is it actually doing for mobility? Is it actually delivering value for the users? And that's ultimately what we should be judging the stuff on. It's not in any sense in which I'm thinking that America should be subsidizing cities or stopping people from moving to the suburbs in any way, shape, or form. Choice is, you know, I'm an economist. There's nothing I believe more, in, more than freedom and choice. But we should not have social engineering that acts as if the American, American dream can only lie behind a white picket fence in the suburb. And smart transportation, sensible transportation, is part of realizing a more inclusive American dream that involves all types of, all types of living.